Okay, good morning, everyone. Oh, sorry, not good morning, so we should say good night. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so today we are going to talk about physical policy. Uh, so, but before um, we talk about this chapter, a few things um, regarding to the exam, regarding to um, your final paper. So I have a look at, uh, I just check out the, uh, the online uh, Google Doc. Uh, it seems like we only have, let's see, so how many students? Yeah, so we only have the six sign up. So which means we still have four, I believe, four students has not signed up yet. So next Monday, we are going to have our second midterm. And then, then so once we uh, return from, wait, so, right. So today is November 16th. Um, it seems like nobody signed up for today. And then so next Monday, which is going to be November 23rd. So we are going to have our second midterm. And then so after we come back from on um, Thanksgiving, so November 30th and December 7th. So that's going to be scheduled for our um, individual final paper presentation. Uh, so this year it seems like we have fairly low enrollment because uh, usually I have like 20 students. Now, so we, I'm not sure. So maybe we have like 10 students left. So there are several students dropped throughout, uh, during the course of the class. Uh, so that just gives us more time to, to do your uh, final paper presentation. All right, so that means, so every student probably has up to 30 minutes, right? So in terms of format, I would say, so your group presentation is a good, is a good benchmark. And so actually, and I wanna particularly um, mention one group's presentation. I think they did an excellent job, which is the last group. So they talk about, let me see. So they talk about which, what they, let me see. Right. My colleague, uh, Malala, darling. So their group talk about worms identify impact of, on education and health. I, so, I mean, it's overall, every group did a good job. So, but their group, so I particularly like their presentation. All right. So uh, in terms of, your term paper presentation. Um, so, so that, so I mean, so those group presentation um, is a good way to look at how, how I want you to present, all right? So that is regarding to um, presentation. Uh, so yes, please make sure you have signed up, okay? Mm. Right. So we have eight slots. So if uh, I'm not sure, so I think we have ten students. So you can add one um, one row for each day, regarding to November 30th or December 7th. Right. So if we have the eight, we have if we have ten students, and then so we need five for each days. Okay. Trying to balance. Right. Do not rush to the last day. Okay. Any question regarding to um, to that part? So I think we have 10, 10 students. Today we have nine students coming, so which means we have one more student so not here. Okay. Make sure to put your name in that in the doc. Any question? Can you post the link to the doc in the chat? Oh, yes, I can do that. Uh, also, I believe there are students who has not submit your homework yet. All right. So please submit your homework, okay? So if you cannot submit online, just send me an email, all right? And maybe just go to Canva to see, so what is your grade for your homework and for your exam, okay? Any questions? For the exam, okay, let me see. So, oh, so now we have one, six, seven. So for the midterm two, 
uh, the midterm tool is going to be a similar, I would say the same format as midterm one, all right? Um, so the homework, homework three uh, should, should give you enough preparation for midterm two. That explains why I explained uh, me, uh, homework three last class. So if you somehow miss that class, or if you have uh, some question regarding to how to solve the homework three, so you may just refer to the YouTube uh, video, right? So just in case some students do not know, so we have a YouTube channel. So I created this YouTube for our class, right? So I have post or the class uh, radio, uh, radio sound that channel, like including last class, last week's, um, including last week's review part. Okay, any questions? So we have, uh, yes, sorry. For um, midterm one, I know you mentioned earlier in the semester doing the extra credit for the seminars. Are we still able to um, attend those and write up a submission? Yeah, absolutely, okay. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's still available, yeah. The last time I looked, uh, they weren't all uploaded. Will they all be available? Uh, what, sorry, the so. Extra credit, uh, the links to the, the extra credit videos. Uh, it is not, yeah, so they are not, they are not uploaded yet, all so, right? So you're, you're saying some are not there. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I think the last time I looked, like, there was only three or four, one or two that were available, because you only said, you gave us, like, the specific ones that related to class, and I think there was only two that we could get the links for. I mean, oh, I'll okay. check again. Yeah, you may try again. So, no, there are four, four are available. So at least on my website. Okay, so, yeah, so for that, so let me, let me find out uh, how we upload, okay? And then so we can sort down. Uh, but for now, so I think the priority is make sure you uh, you schedule a date for your um, presentation. Okay, so so you're editing, but uh, so this is eight students, but still have a two. Wait, so because today we already have a nine student, no? But why only have uh, I only saw. Is anyone's not? Interesting. Because I only see uh, eight students on the list. But for today, we already have, oh, Connor, Connor is, is, you have not put your name yet. No, not yet. I was waiting. Okay. You waited? So you better put like number 30. Okay, Professor, I did just look, and you had told us the dates in one of the classes that you want us to do the write-ups on, and you had said 10-9 um, was the first one, and that's, so that's the one that's available, but any after that was like 10-23, 10-30, 11-6, none of those are available. Right, you're right, so they're not available, so I actually, so I have this, uh, put the, Put all the videos on the, because uh, so this is what this website is maintained by CBA. Oh, I mean, so okay. I certainly, yeah, certainly I can upload to my uh, YouTube channel, but I was worried about this like copyright issue. But it's but from their side, they are very slow. So I mean, maybe so I'm waiting for a few days. If they really just don't, they just very in inefficient. They just probably I just upload on the on our on. Um, our class, uh, class uh, YouTube channel, and then so you can watch the video. Yeah, that would I think that'd be helpful. So then we didn't have to do like all five 
closer to the deadline. Okay, so I can do that. So I can do that this week. So if you have, if you if you didn't receive my email from me, so I you just remind me, all right? So I'm going to. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm probably just upload all the video on on our class on YouTube channel, and then so I just put a link into this website. Let me just go to this website. So I send you this website. Let me see. I'm just send it again. Okay. Thanks. I think like you were saying, CBA does have them all uploaded right now, though. That's where I accessed all the videos from the previous ones that don't no, show so, on yours. Wait, so I mean, I don't know. So so everything, so in like CBS, so the person who is in charge, so she set up a box folder. Uh, I'm not sure, so I can share this box to you. Probably I cannot. I mean, I, so what I suppose, what I'm, cause I'm the, the assignment organizer. I just upload everything to this box, uh, box folder. And then, so they supposed to upload this uh, video on, they supposed to upload this video on, on CBA's website. Uh, uh, not sure. Okay, let's just try to share this uh, to you. And see you can whether you can. Okay, click this website. So I so it means from my part I have uploaded everything um, on this box uh, folder, and then so in CBA so there's office who is in charge of this outreach and or communication. They supposed to upload the video on YouTube. Right. So if they can't do that in the in this week, so I will upload to my where well, YouTube, and then so I give you the link. All right. Any question? Any question regarding to this? No. One, two, three, four, five. No. Oh, okay. So I guess see, so everyone has uh, signed up for the for the presentation. Okay. So the presentation is set. So we have two weeks, or you have two weeks. So November thirtieth and December seventh. There's going to be two weeks. So everyone is going to present. Any question? No. All right. So that is for uh, this kind of. Uh, um, bookkeeping for our class. Now let's just look at uh, these slides. This is going to be the last chapter we are going to discuss for this semester, right? So we are going to talk about the physical policy. Okay. So just quickly re uh, remind you what we have learned. Okay. So basically, we have looked at um, the two part, right? So in the first part of this class, we talk about or we try to understand what is economic development. Okay. And we understand what's economic development and in particularly we understand how that, how, how we compare this with growth. Okay. This is the first part. The second part, we run, a, uh, run through a bunch of theory and uh, some empirical um, studies that understand the growth. Oh, actually, we studied three things. We okay, three, and the third part we start to look at a few things that is um, that is correlated or that is uh, corresponding to um, development. So we look at a population. We look at uh, let me see. So we look at education, right? So we look at um, um, savings. What else we look at? Let me see. Yeah, we look at. Population saving. All oh, right. So we look at actually before population, we look at inequality. Okay. So uh, those things and and so uh, during the students' presentation, we also look at health. Okay, like public health. Right. Uh, those are the things we have looked at. So those are the things, or the economic phenomenon. So that is going to um, happen together with economic development, right? So those are cause and consequence of uh, economic development. So those are things we have to look at. Okay. 
And today, so we're going to look at physical policy. Okay? So this physical policy, in some sense, is going to be helpful to address some of the issue. So we have studied. Say, for example, the physical policy it may be designed to help to deal with inequality. So the physical policy may help to uh, may design to help to uh, solve the uh, public health crisis, and the physical policy may um, deal with the lack of education, right? And then, so physical policy may help to resolve the issue in terms of like aging population, right? So that's regarding to population, okay? And certainly, so certainly, physical policy can also help with uh, individual saving and investment decision. So that's important in the sense, so saving and uh, investment leads to long run economic growth, right? So that is just a role of, uh, of a physical policy. But then, so interesting, you're gonna see, so the physical policy or effectiveness of physical policy is gonna be depending on the level of development. Okay? It is quite intuitive. Okay, so I will go to details, but now I'll just give you an overview. And why is that? So this is because, first of all, what is physical policy? Physical policy in the in in the very um, the layman word, they basically just says, so the government relies on tax, relies on tax, or borrow, borrow to what? To finance some government spending or to finance some government program, okay? So why they want to finance the government spending and the program? So those things are designed to address those issues we talk about, including aging population, education, saving, inequality health, like public health issue, right? So that is the government want to do. And then so you may wonder, okay, so why we need a government to do this, okay? So can the market solve this issue? The answer is, most of the time, we cannot rely on the market, or in some sense, sometimes the market may fail, right? So in your intermediate or microeconomics, so you probably have seen plenty of examples in which government fails, right? And so you may have heard about the term called public goods, okay? So there are some goods, so they, are, they have a particular property, which is public goods, so in the sense, so we cannot rely on the market to provide. A perfect example is, is like firework, right? Or another perfect, or, or another common example where we heard is the, the, the lighthouse, right? So in the, in the near the ocean, the lighthouse. And so those are the public goods. We really can rely on the market to provide or to effectively provide those goods. So that's why we need the government. Okay. And we need a government to provide those uh, spend or to, to conduct those spending and provide those goods so that we can um, improve uh, the aspect of our economy in the following five different senses. Okay. Now, so where the money coming from? So they either come from tax or coming from borrowing. Let's just leave the borrowing aside okay, for a second. Think about tax, right? Uh, so as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, so I say, so the effectiveness of government policy has a lot to do with the level of economic development, largely because so in the less developed country, the government may have hard time to collect tax. Why is that? It's because in the less developed country, the financial market is not well, well established. Right? So the, the institution is very weak, okay? Uh, and so in that sense, the government may not have an effective way to collect tax revenue, or in some sense, it just really cannot locate uh, the business or the individual precisely, right? So in that sense, so in less developed countries, so they may have a hard time to get these tax, but for sure, so if they can get gen generate enough tax in an efficient way, how can they finance this large amount of spending or government program so that to improve the economy in these um, five different sense or five different field, right? And then, so some of you may argue, okay, so why not just let the government borrow? Okay, so that's similar to tax. So in a 
less developed country if they borrow domestically. So the financial market is not well quite uh, established. So they can have a hard time. Now, if they want to borrow internationally, say, for example, an African country, they borrow from international agency. Okay? And then there's because of their weak institution or their, their um, poor economy. So they may um, have paid higher price, higher price or high interest rate to borrow. So in that sense, just make the borrowing less efficient as well. Okay, so that just give an overview. So to understand the physical policy and how this physical policy may um, correlate with your level of economic development. But certainly physical policy is very important. It is important uh, uh, related to these five aspects we have talked about regarding to economic development. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, that's overview of this chapter. Okay. Now here, just um, uh, kind of uh, define what is physical policy uh, and why we need a uh, uh, physical policy. Okay. So in modern economy, government play government played an important role in providing so public goods. Right, it's just what is public good? The example you think about, um, like the development of vaccine, okay? uh, reallocation of resources, redistributing income. So why we need redistributing income? This just to reduce the inequality. This is also is going to be useful to help those who are in a disadvantaged um, position or, or who are um, who may be unlucky in terms of their economic well-being. Okay? Not necessarily their faults. So maybe just born um, poor or born um, unhealthy, right? So in that sense, the government can redistribute some income toward those um, disadvantaged group okay? to make our economy uh, more fair. And then so we, may, we may need the government to regulate market. Okay? Uh, so why we need regulated market? So example can be think about the pollution. Right, so and then so we need the government to regulate the market so that we reduce the pollution. Okay, so why we need the government to regulate and why the why the market cannot resolve that issue? Uh, this is because the pollution has a natural good externality. Right, so this is essentially so um, you are going to affect a bystander who are not participate in the uh, economic activity itself. So in that sense, the, for the person who provide or uh, who, or generate pollution, so this individual business may not take into account all the costs, including social costs and the, and the private costs. So in that sense, we may need the government to regulate the market. And another reason why we need the government is maybe the government to maintain macroeconomic stability and a good business environment. Okay, so that's important for uh, investment decision. Okay, and that's going to be important for long run economic growth. Okay, so that's the role of the government in modern economy. Okay, and so other way to look at it is the government is involved in many aspects of the economy, including education, healthcare, infrastructure, national defense, social safety net, capital market regulation, environmental protection. If we, if we look at those things, you can see clearly those aspects of our economy has some particular particular natural in the sense free market may not may not be able to effectively effectively to provide the optimal amount. Let's just speak. Um, let's just go maybe go one by one. Start start with education. So why the free market may not be able to uh, provide the efficient amount of education? It's because education has positive externality. Okay? So what is Park's positive externality? So just think about the election, right? So the education is going to provide positive externality in the sense a more educated voter may be able to uh, cost or may be able to put a, a, a more educated vote or better vote so that we have a better uh, leader for our society. Okay? But this benefit 
this benefit is going to benefit somebody else. So in, in that sense, as an individual, so I may not, I may not able to collect all the benefit the education give to me. Okay, not to mention the person who provide education. So in that sense, so the market may not be able to provide a efficient level of education. So this is education. Now healthcare, healthcare in some sense has similar um, similar aspect like education. Or maybe you can think about for now. Maybe you can think about vaccine. Okay, even in a regular time, think about flu shot. Right. So the flu shot also has this externality, but again, it's like positive externality. Right. So if I get flu flu shot, so I personally pay the cost. Okay? Either it's the cost to buy to pay for the flu shot or the pain or the suffering I have to uh, I have to endure. Okay? So that's a private cost. But so if I get uh, get a vaccine, not only myself get protected, uh, I would also pr um, provide an externality to the society in the sense I'm going to slow down the spread of the disease, right? But then so so again so due to this positive externality, so the free market may not be able to fully um, capture this um, private cost and the positive uh, in, uh, private cost and the social cost or private benefit versus a social benefit. So in that sense, we may need the government to help to provide healthcare, okay? So maybe just uh, stop here for this example. Now let's just move to the next part. So the government collect tax, um, this, right, so it should say, like government collect tax to finance spending, right? Okay, um, right, so then so what is physical policy? So physical policy essentially is the government adjusts spending and change their tax, tax rate or tax taxation to uh, to to finance the um, government program, right? And if we think about the um, an economic fluctuation or think about the business cycle, the government may also use fiscal policy to stabilize the economy, right? So this is fiscal policy. So now we first look at uh, government expenditure. So for the government expenditure, we have different ways to look at uh, government expenditure. One dimension to look at is by looking at recurrent expenditure okay, versus capital expenditure. Okay? So this recurrent expenditure is coming frequently on a regular basis. And, and in the parentheses, I put a couple of consumption. And, and here, example include wage. This is a wage for government employees. And the interest rate, essentially, they just paid for the, uh, the, the money the government borrowed, the bond the government issued. Okay? And health, this is public health. Education, right? So the government spend money on education, and the subsidy transfer. So that's going to help to resolve the inequality, right? So this is a recurring exp expenditure. So everything is can um, happens in on a frequent basis okay, or regular basis, right? So the other type is called capital expenditure. Okay? It can be one times, or it can be contingent, contingent on the economic. Uh, economic um, economic situation, right? So this including investment, okay? So the government investment, investing in infrastructure, like build on bridge or highways, right? So this is one way to differentiate or to categorize government expenditure. Okay? So now here we can look at, uh, look into details but look at um, several subgroups. First is the wages and the salaries of civil servants, teachers, and the military personnel. Right? So this, this part of the spending becomes a large fraction of government expenditure in the develop, developing country. Right? Or in other words, so the developing country, so they spend a, a bigger fraction of money 
to pay for their employees, the government employees. Right? So they have very little resource they can use to pay for other aspects. So for example, to provide better healthcare, to provide better education, infrastructure, so on and so forth. And here we can look at the example okay, to see a particular developing country, how would they spend the money on this wage and salaries? And how would that affect the, uh, their economy? Right? So we look at money. So, so this country has a population of 11 million in 2002. So the per capita income is very low. So this country is, is if you look at average individual, they live under absolute poverty. Their life expectancy was very low in the, between 2000 and 2005. Uh, it, was, it was only 48 years, right? But there was some improvement compared 1970 to 1975. Okay. So, after, so this country was was uh, uh, was independent in 1960. Since their independence, civil service expanded rapidly. Okay, in 1980, sorry, 1983, total public uh, sector accounted for 30, uh, 63 percent of the employee. So, in in some sense, so the uh, government generate a lot of jobs. It could be a good thing, right? But it can also be a bad thing. Right? In that sense, they attract too many talents into this public sector. So this public sector, overall, they, 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 may, be, uh, they may be beneficial to economic growth, but the public sector cannot be the engine of economic growth. Okay. So if the public sector has has attracted too much too much talent in the uh, for, uh, in the population, so in the long run that is going to reduce the economic growth, right? So this is a uh, wage and a service. Now we look at uh, second group. It's called government purchase, right? It includes goods and a service. The good includes computers, tables, equipment and materials for employees, military equipment, right? So those are the goods purchased by government, right? So that government can conduct their basic functions, right? So service include construction, janitorial works, right? Construction, say, for example, so the city of Omaha, so they hire a local contractor to renovate the highway. Right, so uh, so during this renovation, so they first they purchase goods maybe through the contractor, right, including cement, including rocks, so on and so forth. But and then so this local contractor provides service to finish the job, right? So this is the second second group, government purchase. Now the third group is called interest payment. So essentially interest on government debt. Last the class, we have students to present government debt. So for most of the country or average, the government debt is close to is close to 100 percent of GDP. Okay. Um, so just imagine if a country has 100 so have a debt of 100 percent of GDP. Now let's say for example, if the borrowing cost is 10 percent. And that means every year, every year. So this country must, must spend 10% of their GDP to, to service their debt, okay? But remember, on average, the uh, most of the modern economy, if we look at advanced economy, the government total spending is probably around 30 or even lower. What if that's the case, then, then this means, so this country every year, every year, 33% of the government expenditure will be used to serve the debt. Serve the debt, right? So in, 
India in 2003, so they actually they spent 27% of total government expenditure to serve their debt. Some students may wondering, isn't that 10% so high? Because I just heard from the news, in the US, the treasury, treasury bond, the interest rate of the treasury bond is close to 1%, and it's declining. Isn't that 10% so too high? The, the, as a matter of fact, yes, for US government, they can borrow at low rate, like close to 1% or maybe 2%. But that's not the case for other countries and particularly for developing countries. For developing country, they pay usually they pay much higher interest rate, and due to the risk of default. All right, so this is interest payment, and a subsidy. Subsidy is another mm, big categories of government spending. So those include subsidies to consumer, social welfare payments, and the subsidies to state enterprise. Right. So this social welfare, if we think about the United States, this includes Medicaid, Medicare, right? And maybe food stamps, right? Subsidy to state enterprise. Okay, use US as example. You can think about these subsidies to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? So that is, those are um, government uh, sponsored enterprise. So the purpose of those business was to provide some public goods to the pub, to the population. Okay. So if we look at Brazil in 1998, 63 percent of total expenditure goes to subsidy. The next one is intergovernmental transfer. Right. So in in Japan. In 2001, 30% of the total expenditure went to intergovernmental transfer. Okay. So if we, if you're interested in, so you can look at uh, a selected countries and to see how those countries uh, spend their money. So right here we call it government, uh, general government outlays by functions. Okay. So here we look at public service, defense. And so we also look at like health, education. Okay, so we can look at this table to see how uh, these countries spend their money. Okay? And it's, so in these slides, most of these are developed economy. So if you compare to the next slides, those are developing country. So you can see there are some uh, difference, right? Okay. So, for example, in general, in developed countries, so they spend less in health and education. Okay. And if we look at United States, so that just gives you a breakdown of federal government expenditure. And remember, this federal government, so the state government, they also have some expenditure. Okay. In the United States, in the United States, you can see, so the social security is uh, probably the, is the largest spending, and then the next goes to national defense. Right. Okay, so this is a long-term trend for government spending, right? And so, again, this is for the United States, and you can see there's one thing that was uh, rising rapidly, it, uh, social, cultural, education development. Right? So this triangle. Okay? So actually this includes, so this includes like some, the social security payment. And this includes uh, the Medicare, right? And this reflects the aging population as we uh, discussed in the chapter of population. Now we go to the second part of this chapter. So we are going to look at tax. Right? So essentially here is uh, is income source for government. Right? So the government largely relies on tax to finance their spending. Right? And we just look at spending. 
right? So we have basically, so there are recurring um, spending and uh, investment spending, right? Okay, so now let's look at tax. The general goal of taxation is to, is to do the following four things, right? But first, but first of all, so tax is, uh, is a way to generate income for the government, right? But this taxation, this, just is, this is in terms of uh, how to structure the taxation or how we design the tax policy. Okay? So the, the tax taxation or tax policy must, must try, to, um, try to reach the following goals. Number one, efficient resource allocation. Okay? How we understand that? So just think about, just, just think about um, education, right? So the education has positive externality, as I mentioned earlier, right? And then, so without government intervention or without taxation, so in general, so we will, we will provide or we will carry uh, 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 the amount of education less than efficient level. Right? This is because the individual who makes education decision, they only cares about the private benefit. They won't factor in the social benefit. Right? And from the social standpoint of view, and then, and then so you will underinvest in education. And then, so a good taxation will factor in. So then, so how we are going to restore the efficiency? And then typically, or an intuitive way is to subsidize, right? They, so the government taxation will subsidize education so that, so that we can reach the social optimum. Now this is efficient resource allocation. Second, the satisfactory distribution of income. Remember earlier we talked about income inequality. And in general, so most developed country, so they have progressive tax, meaning richer you are, higher tax you pay. Right? So this satisfactory distribution of income is to address the inequality. Right? So yesterday I was reading newspaper. It seems like uh, President-elect um, Joe Biden He's going to uh, reform the 401k in the United States. And so the main goal of that is probably just reduce the inequality. Okay? But the details hasn't been uh, laid out yet. Okay. Now, the third goal is full employment with price stability. This has a lot to do with business cycle. Now, save example. Save example. So we are in a COVID um, pandemic, right? And then, so earlier this year, not, not only United States, not only developed country, okay? And pretty much every single country in the world, but certainly, so the poor country or developing country, they may, uh, have, they may, may be less able to uh, carry out full, um, uh, uh, carry out large scale of um, physical um, physical speed stimulus, right? But the point of that physical policy or physical stimulus or the physical support, uh, support is trying to trying to help the economy to um, to support employment and to maintain price stability. Right? So that's another example. So now the last goal of taxation is to provide a high stable growth rate of output. So in that sense, so typically most country will have lower capital tax or lower um, corporate tax compared to other tax. And then why is that? It's because economic theory taught us, so capital tax is more distortionary than other tax, think about consumption tax, right? And then, so we may not want to tax capital too heavily, because that's going to distort individual and business incentive to invest. 
that is going to undermine long run economic growth. Okay, so those are the goals of taxation. Now let's look at criteria to evaluate different taxes and tax policy. For the certainty, this is going to correspond to those four goals we just explained. Allocation efficiency. Okay, so that corresponds to efficient resource allocation. Equity, that corresponds to a satisfactory distribution income. Administrative feasibility. Okay? So this probably loosely related to this, but it's also uh, this, but this, right, this is loosely related. So in the sense, so when the economy is in a recession, Right, and then so typically it's a government want to reduce tax and increase spending. And they are hoping so the economy can recover quickly. And then so they can, they can, um, the economy can move forward. And then hopefully the future economic growth can pay off the debt they have to carry because the government um, just reduce the tax and increase spending, right? So this is in some sense that's loosely related to that. The lastly, revenue productivity, right? So they just say, so the government collect this tax, but they want to make sure, so this tax, this tax revenue has been used in the most productive way, right? So for example, so if they collect tax, they may uh, use the tax to subsidize uh, new energy or subsidize high tech, right? Okay, so that's, those are the criteria to evaluate taxes. Okay. All right, so let's look at next slides. So if we look at a developing country, okay, raising tax revenue can be challenging or in general is very difficult. And why is that? It's because accounting is rudimentary or maybe not exist. So because most of the business or most individual in developing country, they work in uh, informal sector, right? So the government may not have, may not able to keep track of their business activity. If the government can't attract their business activity, how can the government collect the tax they own? So in that sense, so those less developed country, they really cannot rely on tax revenue too much, right? Uh, or like general tax, right? And then, then, so for this less developed country, so they may rely on taxes on trade, right? So because international trade, so they can control, right? So this is in, they're just through their, there's a, the, those are the economic transaction across their border borders, right? So in that sense, they may be, um, they may be can, they may able to uh, control the, the economic activity in that front, okay? And here we have example in some African countries, okay? So uh, the import taxes at some point accounts for half of government revenue, okay? But if the country relies, relies on tariff, which is import tax or export tax, that is going to, uh, that's going to lead to smuggling or smuggling becomes, uh, becomes more common, right? So say for example in China, in early stage of their economic, uh, economic development, right? And so the smuggling, uh, smuggling of cars, TVs and the cameras um, becomes a big problem. Okay. Uh, so besides import tax, those countries may also rely on export tax and um, raw material. Remember, this is developing country, right? So what they really can be export probably is like raw materials, right? An example including Colombia, so they export coffees, and then Gambia they export peanuts, Sri Lanka they export tea. So they are going to um, um, they are going to levy tax on those goods they exported. Okay. 
Now, the second type of uh, tax resource is personal and uh, corporate income tax. So this is a direct tax. But certainly this is well established in developed country. And for developed country, so that's the major tax in uh, tax revenue. But that's not the case in less developed country. Right? Very few developing country can rely heavily on personal income tax because they're accounting or because of their social um, um, accounting system is very rudimentary, right? Also because of the tax loophole and the tax evasion. And because because most of people are uh, working in informal sector. So lots of economic transaction just um, carry out through cash, not much business uh, record, right? And so in those countries, corporate income tax are also not effective in raising revenues due to the same reason, right? And the corporate sector is small. And not only small, and most of our in informal sector, okay? This is the second. Now, the third type of tax is called sales and excess tax. So this is considered indirect tax, okay? Uh, they are more effective in raising tax revenue. This is because, so whenever you go to shopping, okay, and then there's typically, there's a business uh, record for that shopping, right? So this is, in, and this is a sales tax. What is excess, excess tax? Those are tax on very specific goods, such as tobaccos, alcohols, gas, right? But, over, so, but both of these types of tax is considered consumption tax. So consumption tax in general is, is less distortionary. So what does distortion mean? If we say a tax is distortionary, meaning so the tax is going to change your incentive, okay? And particularly change your economic activity. Like say for example, investment. Say, for example, labor supply. Now, consumption tax won't or will distort very little on that front. Now, so you, you may not change much of your, uh, on your uh, investment decision or you won't change much your labor supply decision because of the consumption tax. Now, so in that sense, so consumption tax is a better tax or some more effective tax compared to labor tax or we call income tax or um, capital tax. Think about capital gain tax. Like uh, those taxes are going to distort uh, individuals or business economic activity. But yes, of course, so consumption tax is going to change your incentive. So if you get them about tobacco tax, Okay, so that's going to reduce your incentive to smoke. Okay. Or by the way, so those type of taxes designed to um, correct some unhealthy behavior. Okay, so this is a third type of tax. Now the fourth type of tax called value added tax. So this tax on added value. Okay, what is the added value? So essentially. It's just the value of final goods minus intermediate goods. Okay. What is the final good? Let's say, for example, so the computer I'm using right now to give you a lecture. So this is a final good. But this computer, so you have to make a computer. So the company, they have, they have used a lot of intermediate goods, including the the, the um, displaying panel, including the CPU, right? The CPU, the RAM, okay? The monitor, so on and so forth. Those are the intermediate, intermediate goods. And then the so value added tax is going to tax the difference in this particular goods. Or when I, when I purchase this computer, Okay. 
and then I will pay the tax for the difference between the final goods, which is this computer, and the value of those intermediate goods, which is used to make this computer, right? But of course, so the whoever make this computer, so when they purchase those intermediate goods, including CPU, including RAMs, so this company, they, they, they need to pay the uh, value added tax for those goods, right? But of course, so CPU, they use other intermediate goods. Okay, so, so in that sense, value added tax, it, it, is, it is a consumption tax. Right? But it's not a tax on the final price. It's a tax on the difference between the final price you paid and the intermediate cost we need to make these products, right? So in reality, so the value, ta value added tax and the consumption tax, they are going to have impact on business decision. Let me give you an example, okay? Let's just say we have a, um, let me think about what's a good example. Let's say for example, there's a beer company, okay? Beer company. So this company is located as headquartered in uh, Iowa. And this company, they sell their product in Nebraska and Iowa. So under consumption tax system, okay, both Nebraska government and Iowa's local government, they are going to collect consumption tax for each beer sold in Omaha, right? So this is under consumption tax. Now, if we, if we have value added tax, right? And then, so the Nebraska, the local government won't be able to collect value added tax or they may just collect very little value added tax is because this company is, is located in Iowa, right? So that's the difference. But then furthermore, so this difference, this difference may give the government, particular local government, different economic incentives. Okay, so under this, value added tax, the Nebraska local government, they may have some policy to support local beer company. And then why they do that is because they can collect more tax, right? This is not necessarily a good thing, particularly when the local beer company is less competitive or less efficient, right? So. In United States, we do not have value added tax. Even though we have value added tax, the story I just told you may not matter too much. But this story or this situation becomes quite important in a less developed country. Because they have very little resource they can collect tax. And their industry are still in developing, in the development stage, right? So if, if the local government responds to this value added tax by protecting their local business, so that may hurt the aggregate economy in the sense that reduce competition, reduce innovation. Right? So you may want to replace this beer company to some other like high tech company. Okay. So this value added tax. So those are the four different types of taxes. Okay? And so here, so we can, so I give you the, the different type of tax and in different countries. And so there are uh, their compositions. 
Sí. And this is for United States. I can sleep here. All right. So those are things. Right. So maybe you can look at it here. So for the United States, you can see individual income tax is 40% of the total tax revenue and the payroll tax. So this is just individual and the business, business income tax, right? So these two accounts for almost, almost 80% of the total tax revenue. Right. But this is not thinkable in a developing country. So for example, if we look at no uh, wait, so this is this probably the United States. Now maybe we can look at a developing country. Look at uh, China in 2010. Right. So in China, so they have value added tax. And if we look at the uh, uh company income tax, personal income tax. So look at here, so personal income tax is only 7% versus 40% in United States, right? Okay. I guess I'm going to skip here. As given the discussion of these taxes and uh, how we value, how we evaluate taxation, uh, the here a few things regarding to how we can reform the tax system. Uh, this is for developing country who may want to improve their taxation. Right. So number one, so they may want to, want to widen the tax base by including more goods and the broader broader on um, the uh, broader group of the uh, households individuals firms and include them in their tax net right so that relies on more advanced accounting system or they need to better information, right? So in that sense, that's going to broaden their tax base. So allows them has a bigger, to have a bigger tax revenue, a possible tax revenue, or also make the tax collection more efficient, right? And secondly, so they may want to lower tax rate and improve tax administration. In general, tax is distortion. And in general, tax is not good for, um, for economic efficiency, right? And then so in general, they may want to lower tax, but how they can, uh, how can they can collect a uh, certain amount of tax revenue, then they may want to widen the tax base. Yeah. And then for developing country, it may be a good idea to adopt the value added tax. Yes, I talk about the difference between added value added tax versus consumption tax. And in some case, value added tax may not, may not be uh, efficient compared with consumption tax. Okay. But overall, value added tax is a better solution for developing country. And because of their accounting system is very rudimentary. And it value added tax may be also a better alternative compared to consumption tax. This is because consumption tax, yes, in general, is not a distortion. But this consumption tax, in some sense, becomes regressive. Why is that? This is because, this is because, so regardless who you are in the income distribution, everybody pay the same fraction, same percentage for consumption. That is going to translate into a 
larger effective tax rate for low income versus high income, right? Because essentially you just divide the consumption tax they paid by their income. Okay. Yes, lower income households, they may consume less, but percentage wise, they pay the same percentage to the amount they consume and then divide it by their consumption. So you're gonna see, so under this consumption tax, the tax system becomes regressive in the sense the poor pay higher effective tax compared to rich. On top of that, so this consumption tax may force someone to pay a higher tax than their income. Or in, in other words, so this consumption tax may become not affordable to those very poor person. Okay? So in that sense, this value added tax may be a better alternative compared to consumption tax. And this is particularly true in developing country. And here we have an example. We look at Bolivia in, uh, in terms of tax reform in uh, 1980s. So before the reform, the unemployment rate in Bolivia was very high, close to 20%. They have hyperinflation. Okay? And the tax revenue is very low, 1%. Okay? And by the way, so here, so this inflation, we can also consider this kind of tax, right? This is called inflation tax. And from here you can see, so the government relies on inflation to pay their spending because they can, they can collect very little tax. Right? And then, so in 1986, they started reforms. So they uh, start to control the national spendings. Okay? And the uh, government have some, uh, in, 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 in modern economics language, they have some austerity. So the, each day, the government is going to authorize payments of only as much as tax they can collect. So basically, they just balance their um, budget. Okay. Um, right, so that's Bolivia. Uh, what else? What else they have done? So they have 10% withholding tax on income from all sources. Uh, so in some sense, they just, re, they just enforce the income tax collection. Yeah. And so, but however, so this income tax can be offset by VAT tax they paid. Okay. So um, conditional, you conditional you provide sales receipt. Okay. Also, so the country, the government eliminated the direct contact between low level tax officials and the taxpayers to avoid corruptions. Because in this less developing country, so the tax officials may uh, evade those tax or just divert the tax revenue they collect. Okay, and then so there are only a fraction of the tax revenue eventually goes to the government. And lastly, they abolish personal corporate income tax and they switch to value added tax. And the firms pay a fixed fraction of the tax on their net worth. And so after the reform, 1990, so the tax revenue increased to 14% of their GDP and the inflation went down to 9% in 1992. So this is a tax reform in Bolivia back in 1980. Now, we can look at the relationship between taxes and economic development. Right? So this is a topic so has been, um, has been discussed by one of the group last week. Right? So the taxes can have impact on economic, group, economic development through the following channels. First, taxes can affect private investment. 
right? So usually, so higher tax, that is going to reduce private saving, but that's going to increase public saving. So basically, the tax essentially is what? Is a transfer from private to public. That's going to reduce private saving. I mean, of course, that's going to increase public saving. And the tax also reduce your incentive to save. Because each dollar you save, the return you're going to receive is going to reduce by the amount of tax the government's going to levy. So that's in that sense, so you have less incentive to invest or save. And over long term, so that's going to undermine economic growth. Right. So tax also affect capital mobility. Usually lower tax will attract foreign capitals and prevent capital flights. So that because lower tax is going to increase net tax return. Okay, so first think about inside a country, like in the United States. Okay? So there are many companies uh, registered in state of Delaware. And why they do that is because Delaware has very favorable tax code for corporations. Internationally, so there are many companies, particularly multinational companies, they, are, they choose to headquarter in Switzerland. And why is that? It's because Switzerland, they have very low corporate tax. Right? And then we can look at example, Hong Kong back in 1997. So most of the investor move away or uh, there was a capital flight, the capital flight to Canada. Why, what caused this capital flight to Canada? after 1997 is because of political uncertainty. Because right? in 1997, so British government returned Hong Kong to mainland China, right? And then so the investor was worried about the political uncertainty or political instability after the return of Hong Kong. So that's caused a capital flight. But then after, afterwards, after 1997, and then they find out, so the system was fairly stable. And the opportunity there was, was pretty bright. And furthermore, because the tax rate in Hong Kong is much lower compared to Canada or other place, they can, they can save them and put their money. And as an outcome, so most of the investor return to Hong Kong. Okay. So this is taxes and capital mobility. The next one is taxes and income distribution. Okay. So this tax can affect income distribution largely through largely through redistribution. Okay. So this is related to um, this is related to inequality. Okay. Um, so this, redis this distribution or redistribution, essentially it just transfer income from higher earners to lower earners, right? So that's going to uh, achieve um, equality, right? So in practice, we may have taxes on lottery consumptions. This is, this is on top of progressive income tax. Right? So this lottery consumption is a targeted tax because those lottery goods are typically consumed by rich income earner. Right? All right, so we can skip this. This just tells you the ver tax revenue as a GDP ratio for several, for a selected group of countries. 
Now the last part of this class of today's uh, lecturing, so I'm gonna to explain to you government and economic development. So, and thanks for the group in last, last, uh, last the week. So they, they have touched most of the topic here, right? Here I'm gonna talk about two things. One is economic growth, or sorry, economic development and the government side. The other is government and economic growth. Okay, so let's start with economic development and the government side. Okay, the question is, is there any correlation between economic development and the government size? Okay, so first is correlation. And secondly, is there any causality? Or in other words, so it's because larger government size leads to better development or economic development leads to larger government. That's the that's a causality. The correlation just tells or just, uh, just uh, shows. So maybe these two things are go hand in hand. That doesn't tell you who caused who or which leads to which, right? So far, so far, we find out is in general, the relative size of government tends to increase as per capital income increase. That's a general empirical observation. Okay, and so traditionally, economists believe there are three reasons that explain this correlation or why the size of government tends to increase as per capita GDP increase. The number one reason behind that is because economic growth is make the economy more complex, more complicated. And this increasing complexity requiring continued introduction of new laws or institutions or legal structures. But these new laws and, uh, and the new development of legal structure needs more government uh, employees to either to uh, enforce or to regulate it. Right, so that's the uh, first reason behind or first uh, argument behind this correlation. And secondly, as, as the economic growth, so the economy becomes urbanized. People move to large city or people start to live in a densely populated area. So that's going to generate or to increase more negative externality, include congestion, crimes, or pollution, right? So those things is gonna justify more government intervention, right? Or we, re we rely more on the government. So that's, that's going to make the size of the government increase. And then lastly, the good supplied by the public sector have a high income elasticity of demand. That means, so when the income increase, we demand more and more that type of goods. Think about education, think about public health. Right? So the higher income you have, you may want to have a better education for your children. The higher income you have, you may want to have high quality healthcare so that you have better uh, life or you have uh, extended life expectancy. Right, but that is going to uh, is going to cause for a larger size of the government because those are 
provided by the government. Right. But unfortunately, regarding to the last argument, so this one. Okay? So empirical studies fail to convincingly support the elasticity is greater than one. Or in other words, so this is not a good argument for a larger size of government as income increase. Right. But then nevertheless, nevertheless, over time, government size has increased in many countries. And the rich countries seems to have larger size of government. Think about most European countries. Okay. We can look at historical data. At the start, at the beginning of 20th centuries, total 7% of GDP and 4% was spent at the local level. Right? So like, or in other words, 7%, or this government size is like 7%. Okay, that's at the beginning of 20th century. So we, here we look at the United States, but, but most of the European country has a similar pattern. Okay. Federal spending spiked in World War I, okay. but in the 1920s, local government spending still accounts for 50% of the total spending, uh, this regarding to here. Right. So this federal spending, so this one way to measure in the size of the government, but it's probably like a temporary. And in 1930s, we, we moved to here, in 1930s, federal spending surged to near half. So that just in terms of uh, federal versus um, um, state government. Right. After the spike of World War II, the federal shares increased and the state share as a percentage of GDP also increased. This over World War II. You can see there's a steady increase trend in terms of government spending. By 2010, federal spending was over 20% of GDP, state is around 10%. Okay. Local spending exceed 10%. So you can see, so right now, so the spending is more than 40% of the total GDP, okay? So to compare with 7% back in 1900, right? So this is a general trend. This is a general trend for the United States. And this is, you're gonna see similar trend in European country. And overall, this is uh, what happens in most advanced economy, right? And so these two, the first two reasons, these first two are good arguments. Uh, so because the economy becomes more and more complex and we have, we have urbanization, we have this congestion and uh, um, crimes. But for the United States and for a European country, uh, one thing is worth to mention. We have this aging population. But the first is a social safety, social safety net. Uh, so this social safety net include the introduction of social security after World War II okay? and the Medicare or in European country, so the um, socialized medicine. Okay? So that expand the steady increase in the size of government, which is measured by the, the total government spending. Right. And so in terms of the implication to developing country. So we are gonna see a similar trend, right? So as income increase, people is going to care more about those things, including social safety, including better health and a better education. You're gonna see, so throughout history, you're gonna see, so the in developing country will follow the suit of the developed country. So they're gonna have bigger and bigger or larger size of the government over time as they move along the ladder of economic development. All right. So the last things, so I'm going to explain to you is government spending and economic growth. 
So this is this is essentially uh, the other topic has been discussed by um, one group in the last um, last Monday. Yeah. So economists economists has been looking at the relationship between government spending and the per capita GDP growth for a long time. And they have been find out that government spending is negatively related to per capita GDP growth. Please, please differentiate this with to the topic we just look, look at, right? So in the previous um, subsection, we look at the size of government or the government spending versus income level. But here, so we are looking at government spending versus growth. One is regarding to the level. The other is regarding to, regarding to your uh, growth, right? Mm, that's in 1980s, right? So they find, so there's negative correlation. But later, so they have found, like in this paper, they find out the government spending may be positively related to economic growth. Okay. And then later research argue, they may exist a optimal size of government. Okay, so in that sense, in that sense, this probably is related to lawful curve. Okay. What is lawful curve? Lawful curve just tells us there's a harmful relationship between your tax rate and your tax revenue. And why there's harmful so when you increase your tax rate, you're going to increase your tax revenue because for each dollar people earns, so the government is going to take away a bigger fraction. And why it may start to decline eventually? This is because if your tax rate becomes too high or becomes sufficiently high, you are going to discourage people to work, and discourage people to invest or to save. And then the economic activity will, will, be, will be reduced or will be undermined. And remember, tax revenue is a product of tax revenue and the tax base. And the tax base is going to depend on, is going to depend on the economic activity. So if the, ta if the tax rate becomes too large, and then so the tax base is going to shrink, Due to due to the reduced economic activity, okay. So that's that's why there's a hump shape. And similarly, so the government spending may have a similar hump shape. Now, lower government spending at a lower level of government spending. So you increase government spending, it may it may uh, promote economic growth because the government spending can provide some public goods. But this, uh, what, as we increase the size of government spending, you may reduce economic growth. It's because, so the government spending come with a cost, which is tax distortion, right? So essentially there are, uh, there's a trade-off. One is government spending is gonna produce, provide, public goods. The other is the government spending is going to require taxation or is going to generate distortion. At a lower level of government spending, it may, so the first one may dominate the second one or the benefit may dominate cost. Once we increase the size of government spending, or when the share of government spending in GDP increase significantly, and then the cost may dominate the benefit. Right. 
So for developing country, for developing country, so I would say, so they probably in, in the first state, like the good, the benefit may outweigh the cost. So the next one or the last one is taxes. How taxes affect economic growth? So this, this matters, I mean, first of all, or there are two aspects. One is the level of tax or the size of a tax is. The other is the structure, how we, how we tax different economic activity, okay? So holding the tax structure, if we, increase the size of tax, that's going to decrease economic growth. And the reason behind that is due to the distortion of tax. Okay. However, if we hold the size of the tax, so for example, like the, the, the tax rate, if we just hold in the tax rate, and then, then so the, the impact of tax on growth depending on how we structure the tax. So are we relies more on consumption tax or are we relies more on income tax? Are we relies more on labor income tax or relies more on capital income tax? Okay, so they are gonna have different implications or different answer, right? All right, so, oh yeah, so this common dance, right, sorry. So the third aspect regarding to government and economic growth is government debt, okay? So where's the room for government debt? It's because if you write down the government's budget, right, so the government has a spending, or we, or we, we say, or in general we call it G, government spending, so government has, the spending need to finance. So how the government can finance the spending? So they have taxes. What else they can do, they may can borrow, right? But this borrowing, so this is going to include the cost, like a debt service. Right? So this is, uh, we call outlay, of government, and this is essentially this is the income of government, right? So they can generate income through tax. We we're talking about that. So that's come the cause of distortion. The other one is borrow. Overall, borrow or debt is non-distortionary in the short run. Okay. But however, so this debt may have long-term impact. Okay. So that has been covered by this paper, which has been presented by one group on um, past Monday. Okay. okay, so I'm gonna stop here for the new material. So that's what or all I want to say for this uh, chapter. All right. So, any question for me, either for the uh, for this chapter or for uh, exam presentation or for this class?